All right, we're on the home stretch here. We're still in topic for applications of derivatives, but this is our last little, we can call it mini unit. We have day 50, 51, and 52, but all three days are focused on the concept of particle motion. Um, this will conclude our AP Calculus AB semester one, our differential calculus part of calculus. We'll move into integral calculus next semester, and there'll be a bit of downtime here, uh, really about two months till we're back. Um, I'll do my best to record some videos, but um, you shouldn't expect too much until January. So let's just jump into it. Um, part one is our introduction, which hopefully makes sense since this is our introduction to particle motion. Um, what is particle motion? Well, the idea, at least in calculus AB, of particle motion is that a particle or a thing, you can think of a particle as a ball if you would like, um, is moving linearly. So what happens is you can imagine there's a ball on a flat line going this way, or you could have maybe think of a balloon moving up and down this way. So we're either moving along an x-axis or along a y-axis. Now be careful because just because a particle is moving linearly, right, we have this ball that's, you know, moving somewhere over here, moving somewhere over here, it doesn't mean that it's moving at a constant speed because a lot of people think, oh, it's moving linearly, does that mean that every equation is just like y equals 3 or x equals 4? Well, first we have to define what our equations mean, but second, no, um, we can certainly have squares and cubes and signs and everything because you're going to see our equations describe how the particle is moving left or right. And if a particle starts moving slowly and then it goes faster and faster and faster, then we need an equation that takes into account something that moves slowly and then faster and faster and faster. So the graphs we're going to look at are not going to be linear graphs. These graphs, though, are going to describe how our particle is moving in a linear fashion. There are three extremely important concepts in particle motion. They're all related to each other through, and this will be a shocker, calculus. Let's start with our general equation. This is our equation for the position of a particle. Right? We're going to think of this position equation as it's telling us the location of a particle on a number line, either a horizontal number line or a vertical number line. Right? Horizontal is a number line like this, vertical is a number line like that, and this output is going to tell us the position, and the position is going to be where the particle is located on this number line. It's like, oh, it's located here. No, wait, it's located over here, and so on and so forth. So let's look at some notation for our position equations. Um, traditionally, we would say something along, if we're talking about our x-axis, and I'll use the space up here, if we're describing where a particle is located on the x-axis, um, we would say that x is the output here, and it's very weird. x is going to be the output, and it's going to be a function of t. Sometimes you'll see that abbreviated to a function called x of t where t is the input, and using t, that is, of course, going to stand for time, and x is the position on the x-axis, so this is our position output. So what does this mean? It means we plug in a time, like a time of 3. We're like, well, at a time of 3, where is my particle located? And then whatever answer you get tells you where it's located. So if you had something like, we'll say, x of 4 equals 7, this would mean at a time of 4, you are located at x equals 7. And it might help you to visualize a number line up here. Let's say that this is a number line. This is 0, a position of 0. And then over here, you have a position of 7. Well, at a time of 4, you are located at 7 on this x-axis. And, of course, y would be the same thing. We would say that y is a function of t, often abbreviated as y of t, and the input, time, will generate an output, which is a location on a vertical axis. So what are some sample units? Well, the input is time, and time has many units, but we're going to look at the position, the output here. Um, position is location, and it's always measured how far away you are from zero. So some sample units could be something like x equals 5 meters, and that would mean, or I could maybe use 7 over here to match, this would mean like 7 meters, and it means 7 meters to the right of 0. You could also have x equals negative 3 
I don't know, we'll go miles, and that would mean three units or three miles to the left of zero. You could also have y's if you wanted to talk about that balloon going up and down, and you could say y equals two kilometers, or you could say something like y equals negative one feet. Maybe you're swimming and you dive underneath sea level, something like that. Either way, our units are going to be all sorts of distance units. On to velocity. Um, velocity is kind of weird, and we're going to look up at the concept in a second. We're actually going to start with units for velocity, because you know velocities, right? If you're traveling at a velocity, your car travels at a velocity, I think. And so one of the most common velocities we hear, at least in the United States, is miles per hour. Other sample units, we could have feet per second. We could have kilometers per hour and be multicultural here, and so on and so forth. Now, looking at these units, you'll notice that there is a time in the denominator and a distance in the numerator. It looks like they took these distances and divided them by time. And so I think that might actually give us a hint as to how we get from our position to our velocity. These units are a rate, and a rate is almost always going to be a derivative. So if we start with something like x equals some function of t, and we wanted to take the derivative, we would do d dt of each side. And I definitely ran out of room here. Oh well. And this would give us dx dt. And in fact, dx dt is a very common notation for a velocity equation of a particle. You also commonly see this as x prime of t. But of course, we don't want to confuse that, or we don't want to um, forget about our old friend y. So you could also have dy dt, or y prime of t, right? which would tell us the velocity of a particle moving up and down as opposed to side to side. Of course, all of these could be condensed down to one singular formula, v of t. V of t is either a dy dt or a dx dt, depending on the situation, but they are equal all to each other. Now, let's go back to that concept at the top. Velocity is known as a vector, a velocivector sometimes, not a velociraptor, um, and it contains two things. So a vector, uh, and you'll learn more about this in physics or in later versions of calculus, um, a vector is a number or a grouping of numbers that tells you multiple components about a situation. This vector tells you two things that has two components. It's going to tell us not only how fast your particle is moving, sometimes that's called the magnitude of your particle, it's also going to tell us which direction our particle is moving. And this is definitely something new. So let's look at a couple examples. Let's look at d, I'll look at my, we'll say that dx dt equals negative four feet per second. What does that mean? Well, we're also going to compare it to, uh, what did this in blue? We're going to compare it to dy dt equals four feet per second. Well, these particles are moving at the same speed. They are both moving four feet per second. dy dt, because we are positive, means you're moving up at four feet per second. dx dt, picturing that x-axis here, means wherever your particle is, we don't know where the particle is, maybe it's here, it means your particle, because of this negative sign, is moving left at a speed of four feet per second. And so, we see that a positive sign of your velocity implies that you are moving right if you are on the x-axis, or up if you're on the y-axis. While negative velocities mean that you're moving left or down, again with that x and y, right? So this vector idea gives two components here. First, the direction, and second, the speed. And we're going to work on that, so no stress. All right, the last thing we need for our particle motion to well describe it is the idea of acceleration. Acceleration is also a vector, and there's two ways to think about acceleration, but most commonly, acceleration tells you how your velocity is changing, right? Imagine you're driving on the freeway, you're going 65 miles an hour, and then you start to accelerate. 
that means your velocity is increasing. And you can also decelerate, unaccelerate if you will, and you maybe let off the accelerator and you start to slow down. That means your velocity is decreasing. And we know how to describe how a function is increasing or decreasing, right? If I have my velocity, then don't we just take a derivative to describe how velocity is increasing or decreasing? And so it shouldn't shock you here either that velocity is going to be our second derivative of position, right? We have our um, original velocity equations over here. And so our second derivative is going to look like this. Now you could write them out, of course, as d squared x over dt squared, or and switching colors, you could also do d squared y over dt squared. That's fine, but it's very rare to see. More commonly, you see this as the second derivative of position, right? You take two derivatives to get to acceleration, or we might just call this a of t. a of t is very, very common for position, right? Um, a of t. Very, very common for position. Now, what about notation for this? Well, um, that's, I guess, what we just did up above, so let's leave some room for sample units. This is where things get a little bit tricky, right? So I'm actually going to take my example over here and see what happens if I take the derivative. So if I have dy dt equals, and I'm just going to keep this in terms of feet per second, and I want to take the derivative of this. I want to do d dt of each side just so we can see what happens to the units here, right? Then I get d squared y over dt squared is going to be equal to d dt of these units means d feet per second over dt, which means we get units of feet per second, and then what are my time units here if this is seconds? Well, that's more seconds. And so we get feet per second per second, or if you'd like, you can write that as feet per second squared. I prefer this notation. Physicists prefer this one. Totally up to you. So our sample units here are always going to be some distance per time per time. All right? If you want to try to keep that straight, your first derivative is just going to have distance. Your second derivative is, I'm sorry, your zeroth derivative is just going to have distance. Your first derivative is going to be distance over time, and the next one is going to be distance over time over time, or distance over time squared. This two is going to match your second derivative. Alrighty. We have enough now to try some practice problems and get some vocabulary done. So here we go. X of t is going to represent the position of a particle on the x-axis, y of t the y-axis, so here we go. If you hear the phrase, where is the particle initially, right? Initially implies that that is when the time is zero. So if they say, find where the particle is initially given this position function over here, then what they mean is find y of zero. Easy enough. Zero squared minus one equals negative one. And to interpret this, at time of one, the particle is located at y equals negative 1. If you wanted a visual, you picture the y-axis, here's 0, at a time of 0, I don't know why I wrote time of 1, sorry, at a time of 0, the particle is located down here at negative 1. Easy enough. Well then, what does at the origin mean? At the origin is not a time. At the origin is a location, a position, if you will. So what they're telling us then is that's either going to mean that x of t equals 0, or if you're dealing on the y-axis, it means that y of t equals 0. So same equation again. Given the position equation, find the times when the particle is at the origin. So this means the output, the location, the position is 0. Right? They're saying, here is our y-axis, here is 0. What times does the particle end up here? Well, t squared minus 1, we solve, and we get two answers here, plus minus 1. However, traditionally, and the problem will tell you this in the setup, traditionally, we only use positive time values. We don't go backwards in time with those negative time values. So in this problem, it would probably say, let t 
be greater than or equal to zero. And so although you get two answers, the only one that really applies to this is the positive time value. Part C, at rest. What does it mean if you're at rest? I think at rest means you're not moving. Right? It doesn't tell us anything about position here. Right? If we're thinking about position, you can be at rest at a position of zero. You can be at rest at a position of two, at rest at a position at negative three. It doesn't affect position. I think at rest, though, really is talking about our speed, or we always call this velocity in particle motion. So if something is at rest, it means that the velocity, the output of velocity is zero. You have no velocity. You are at rest. All right, well, how do we do this then? Um, well, I think we're probably going to need to find velocity. Velocity is the derivative of position. You're probably going to want to start to memorize that we have position, and then we take the derivative, so we do ddt, and that brings us to velocity. And then we do ddt, and that brings us to acceleration. All right, so if we wanted to find velocity, then we just take the derivative of each side. So we're going to find y prime of t, which I'm going to call v of t, easier. And that is going to be just 2t, easy derivative. Where is the velocity 0? Well, we just set velocity equal to 0, solve for t, and it says a time of 0. So what does this mean? At a time of 0, the particle is not moving. Cool. Moving on. If the velocity of the particle is positive, then the particle is moving to the right or up. However, if the velocity of the particle is negative, then the particle is either moving left or down. Given the velocity equation, this guy, determine the intervals where the particle is moving left and the intervals where the particle is moving right. All right, well, they already gave us velocity, which is very useful because velocity tells us direction, and that's so important to keep straight. The sign of velocity tells us direction. How do we determine different intervals? Ooh, intervals? We've done intervals before. Isn't that just a sign chart? And it is. It all comes together. Here we go. First thing to make a sign chart, we set velocity equal to zero. Let's find where the particle's not moving first. So zero equals e to the t times the natural log of t. Well, this is already in factored form, so I think we just make two equations here. Okay, e to the t equals zero. Well, I think you're going to find that there is no solution here. You can do no power that turns this into zero, so that's easy. Natural log of t equals zero. Hmm. Well, I think this one isn't too bad. We just do e to the power of each side. And so we get t equals e to the zeroth, which is one. All right, cool. Um, is there any place where this derivative doesn't exist? We might as well do all of our critical points. Well, e to the t exists everywhere. Natural log of t does not, though. Natural log of t says that times can't be 0 or negative. You cannot do the natural log of 0 or negative numbers. So we also know, then, that t has to be greater than 0. All right, let's look at our sign chart. Easy sign chart. We are going from 0 to infinity. They didn't give us any endpoint over here, right? We have one critical point, and this critical point causes what to be zero? It causes our velocity to be zero. Now let's see what's happening to the velocity on these intervals. So if we try a number smaller than one, well, we need to try it in this equation up here. Um, numbers smaller than one, that can be a little tricky. Um, but remember, e to the negative first, isn't that one over e? And 1 over e, e is like 2-ish, 1 half. Um, so I think that's pretty much smaller than 1. So if I try that into my velocity equation, e to the negative first, and you'll see that there's a method to my madness, um, I'm not going to try it in e to the t, because e to the t is an exponential. Exponentials are always positive. No reason to try anything in there. It will have no effect on the sign. So instead, I'm just going to substitute this into natural log. Natural log and e undo each other. We get negative 1. Therefore, we know that the sign of this first interval is negative. The second interval is pretty easy, because all we're going to do is try a number between 1 and infinity. Let's try e to the positive 1. Right? e to the first is 2 point something. It's bigger than 1. Natural log of e to the first cancels. Positive 1. This is positive. Now, with velocity, I am not going to make a graph, a sign chart like this. And the reason why is that's not what we're looking for here. We're looking for where the particle is moving left versus moving right. 
So what I like to do is I like to show that um, from 0 to 1, the particle is moving left. And from 1 to infinity, the particle is moving right. And we know that because of the signs of velocity. So we would say from 0 to 1, we move left. How do we know it's moving left? Because v of t is less than 0. And then from 1 to infinity, we move right. And we know that because v of t is greater than 0. Easy enough. Scooting on down. To find the average position, velocity, or acceleration over a time interval, find the slope of the secant line. And really, this should say the slope of the secant line of the function above the one that you're interested in. And so this is kind of weird. Find the average acceleration of a particle given the position equation. So think about units of average acceleration, right? And it might even help if you, and I'm not sure why this doesn't say t in here. That's awkward. Um, think about units of t here. Maybe we think that t is in seconds, and then x is in, oh, let's just do things you're comfortable with, hours, and then x is in miles. Well, then I actually like to write out the units really quickly. Position is going to be just miles, tells you how many miles something is located from the origin, right? Velocity will be in miles per hour, and acceleration will be in miles per hour per hour, miles per hour squared, if you will. All right, we've given position here. We want average acceleration. So let's take a derivative first. Not a shocker, because this is x of t. We eventually need acceleration, which is the second derivative. Let's start with the first derivative. So the derivative of x, I see a product rule. Derivative of 2t is 2. We keep natural log of the absolute value of x the same plus, then we keep 2t the same, and we have to do the derivative of the natural log of absolute value of x, and, or of t, I'm not sure why I'm putting x in here, sorry, um, and that could seem a little intimidating, because you might not remember how to do that absolute value, but it turns out that when we learned this, the derivative of natural log of absolute value is the same as natural log of non-absolute value, it just becomes 1 over what's inside, no more absolute value, times the derivative of what's inside. This is t again. One day I'll get this into my head. Um, and so we end up here. And in fact, I think we can simplify this too, which is really nice. These two cancel. Then um, you can even factor a 2 out front if you want. So I think we're going to get 2 times natural log absolute value of t plus 1. And there is our velocity equation. We can put velocity so we keep it straight. Now, Think about what we need to do here. They're asking for average acceleration. What you're going to find is that to find the average acceleration, strangely, you use the velocity equation. And I'd like to show you why right now. Take it on faith for a quick second, but I'll show you why. So if I want to find the average acceleration, the average rate of change, then I'm going to do the slope of the secant, which is essentially just our slope formula. So my average acceleration is going to be v of, we'll start with positive 1, v of 1 minus v of negative 1 divided by 1 minus negative 1. As we go through here, v of 1, we need to substitute in here, don't we? Um, so it becomes 2 times the natural log, absolute value of 1 just turns it to 1 plus 1, minus v of negative 1, so 2 times absolute value of negative 1 turns it back to 1 again, okay, plus 1, all divided by 1 plus 1. Okay, well, um, any log of 1 is 0. We need to know that. So it really just seems to be 2 minus 2, which is 0, over 2, which is 0. Now, why is this the average acceleration? Well, let's go back and put some units on this. The units in the numerator are velocity units. And I made up some velocity units earlier, didn't I? Miles per hour. So the units in the numerator are miles per hour, which means over here, this 0 is miles per hour. The units in the denominator, though, that's on our input up here, is time. And so this is hours. Hours. And take a look over here. Hours.
And so, by doing the slope formula with velocity, think, what is the slope of velocity? The slope of velocity is acceleration. So by doing the slope formula with velocity, we find the average acceleration, zero miles per hour per hour. And that's pretty tricky. All right, just a couple to go here, and then we should be good for the day. You'll get some practice in, and that's all. So part G, okay? Instantaneous. Instantan, yes. Velocity or acceleration is the velocity or acceleration at a single moment or instant in time. So given x prime of t equals sine of t squared, find the instantaneous velocity. So really what they mean is take the velocity equation and plug in square root of pi over 2. Well, we have x prime of t. Isn't x prime the derivative of position? I think x prime of t is actually the same thing as velocity. They gave us the velocity equation. That's so kind of them. If they had given us position, right, if they had said x of t and you wanted to find the instantaneous velocity, you would have had to take the derivative and then plug in square root of pi over 2. But we're not doing that here. So let's take a look. x prime of square root of pi over 2 is going to be sine of the square root of pi over 2. That guy is being squared like so. So moving to the right, sine of distribute the square, undoes the square root, makes this 4, sine of pi over 4, and we know that one, that's square root of 2 over 2. So at square root of pi over 2 seconds, the particle is moving at a speed of square root of 2 over 2, and because this is positive along the x-axis, we're technically moving to the right at a speed of square root of 2 over 2. All right. If the acceleration of the particle is positive, then the velocity is increasing. And that is because acceleration is the derivative of velocity. And to find increasing or decreasing, you take the derivative, and then you determine where the derivative is positive or negative. So identify the intervals where the velocity is increasing and where the velocity is decreasing given the velocity equation. So they told us this is velocity already. All right, well, if we want to determine where velocity is increasing, decreasing, if you want to determine where any function ever is increasing, decreasing, the very first thing you do, take the derivative. So, well, we can go back to y if we want. y double prime of t is going to be our acceleration at t, and this is just 1 over t. Easy enough. Okay. Um, if we want to determine where this is decreasing or increasing, we find our critical points. So that is where a of t equals 0 or a of t does not exist. I think there's no value you can substitute in here to get 0, so strangely this one is out. But a of t does not exist at 0. 1 divided by 0 does not exist. And then, sign chart, easy enough. Okay. So we want to look at the signs from negative infinity to infinity. They didn't give us restrictions, though normally they would say just time values are greater than zero. There's only one critical point here, and this critical point makes something not exist. In particular, it makes the derivative of velocity, maybe I should have called this v prime, they all mean the same thing. It made v prime of t, which is acceleration, not exist. All right, now let's test signs of v prime so we can see what's happening to v of t. If we try a negative value over here, I don't know why I put t here, that should be 0. If we put a negative value over here, substitute into negative, you get a negative. If we try a positive value, you get a positive. So, to interpret, we're pretty much done. We would say velocity is increasing on 0 to infinity. And I should probably just put this guy right here, right? 0 to infinity, we can't use 0 in natural log because v prime of t, I'm really struggling today, guys. v prime of t is greater than 0. v prime of t is positive. You could also write an argument for where velocity is decreasing, but because these are negative values and we're not allowed to use negatives in natural log, I would argue that this part of the sign chart is kind of a moot point. All right, last one. Oh, sorry, if the acceleration of the particle is um, negative, then velocity is decreasing. 
In order for a particle to change direction, what has to happen? When order, what controls a particle's direction? The direction a particle is moving is controlled by the velocity. So in order for a particle to change direction, the velocity has to change signs. Well, how do we determine where velocity changes signs? We first determine where velocity is zero. We set up some intervals and we look at all the intervals of velocity. So let's look. Identify all times when the position changes direction given the position equation along the x-axis such that it's this. Cool. Well, if we're going to look at where a particle changes direction, we need to examine the velocity, which means we need to find the equation for velocity. Position, velocity, acceleration, we need to find the first derivative here. The first derivative is going to be velocity. 3 cancels it out, becomes t squared, uh, minus 6t plus 8. Cool. All right, next, if we want to find where the particle changes direction, we should probably set the velocity to zero. Let's find where the particle's not moving. And I broke my cardinal rule and I forgot to factor here. What is this? t minus 2 times t minus 4. That looks pretty good. Cool. So we need to set the velocity to zero. Always good to tell them what you're trying to accomplish. t minus 2 times t minus 4 equals zero. And so we find two time values here of 2 and 4. Now you might be tempted to stop here and say, oh, I found where the velocity is zero, so that is where the particle changes direction. But you don't know that yet. In order to see the particle changes direction, we need to see what's happening on either side of 2 and 4. So, quick sign chart. We need to look at the signs of velocity because the velocity controls the direction the particle is moving. We'll just assume we're going from zero to infinity. And we have two values. 2 makes the velocity zero. 4 makes the velocity 0, and let's start substituting values in. Between 0 and 2, let's use 1. 1 substituted in here gives a negative times a negative, which is a positive. 3 substituted in gives a positive times a negative, which is a negative. And 5 substituted in is a positive times a positive. All right, so what's happening? Well, the particle is moving right until we get to 2, and then it is moving left and then it is moving right. So, do we change signs at 2 and 4? Yes, we do. How do we justify it? Pretty easily. There should be some space down below, right? Um, the particle changes direction at t equals 2 and 4 because v of t, or velocity, changes sign at t equals 2 and 4. It's not enough to say velocity equals 0. Velocity equals 0 just means the particle has stopped. But what if you're moving to the right, you stop, and then you keep moving to the right. You didn't change direction, you just temporarily paused. You need to note that velocity changes sign. Okay, at this point you are armed with all of your knowledge that you'll need for today. So now we have two practice problems. Um, the two practice problems we're going to cover today are one that has um, a velocity given to you in a table, and the second practice problem gives you the velocity displayed as a graph. So you'll notice in kind of that hierarchy, I always picture it as a ladder of position, velocity, acceleration, or you can think of it as x, x prime, and x double prime, that they will almost always, in calculus, only give you the velocity. Why will they give you the velocity? Because that's a derivative, and calculus works with derivatives. If you just get the position, a lot of the questions they ask won't involve calculus, and it's kind of silly. So you should not be surprised that they're giving you the velocity in a table and the velocity in a graph. In fact, the only question you should be asking is, Where's my velocity as an equation? And the answer is, we'll see that next class. By the way, please bring your graphing calculator next class too. You'll definitely need it for that equation. Um, if you need help on any of these, please check my solutions on Teams. I'm happy to go over any of them with you as well. You'll find that this is a great review of the entire semester. You are going to have sign charts. You're going to have the candidates test. You're going to have um, theorems on here. Uh, all sorts of fun stuff. It's really going to help you review both for your test coming up in a few classes and also for the final. So thank you for tuning in, and I'm excited to see you all next class.